as you can see, our next speaker is uh, Professor James Jones. And uh, uh, Jim is uh, pretty famous for his tarantula system, which some of you might have heard about, uh, but visualizations in testing and debugging. And he received the 2015 Six Soft Impact Award uh, with uh, some of his colleagues for his uh, previous work. And so we're going to hear more today about understanding and uh, analyzing software. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, and I'll actually uh, review some of the tarantula work in this talk. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, our work in understanding and analyzing software execution behavior. And by software execution behavior, particularly I'm talking about internal behavior of the software system. So consider two watches. You know, one where it doesn't expose any of its internal workings. We just only get to see the second hand move and the minute hand and so on. Um, but consider a, a different one where it actually exposes its internal so you can see how the system actually achieves what it's trying to do. And I've always been the type of person, you know, as a kid I was wanted to take things apart and see like how things are working, like the gears inside and so and such. Which, you know, partially motivates the focus of my research. But this kind of, you know, fascination with the how things work isn't the only motivation for this research. There's actually a number of practical reasons why knowing how software works internally is beneficial for software maintenance. The most obvious of which is debugging. So when things aren't going right with your software, you need to understand, dig into the code, and understand what's happening during execution that makes it so that it's not behaving properly. But there's a number of other reasons that we can utilize such understanding of the workings of systems, such as you know, uh, optimizing for performance to identify where things are running slowly, and so on. We can identify where the code is that's performing certain kind of features, and, and many other um, examples of software maintenance tasks that require us to understand how the software is behaving internally. Um, and so the, um, the early research that I did in this area, the tarantula work, um, built on simple coverage information uh, that was gathered dynamically during execution to, for white box testing. So it basically told you which lines of code were executed by our test suite and which lines of code weren't executed by our test suite. And the main idea for the tarantula work is that we can repurpose and reuse this information that we already have for white box testing in order to help us find bugs in our <coughs> system. Um, the idea here is, well, okay, so this is a visualization of a large software system, right? We have thousands of line of code. This is just a zoomed away view of the code. And you can see like all the indentation and such, it's, it's the structure of the code is still there. Um, the green lines, are lines of code, is, again, it's a zoomed away view of the code. The green lines are lines of code that were executed um, and they're colored <coughs> green because they're executed by a passing test case. Um, and if we look at a different test case, you can see it executes different lines of code. So if we look at different lines of code, you can see the execute, all right, different test cases that execute different lines of code. Similarly, we can look at a failing test case and highlight the coverage of that test case in red. But the real interesting part of the tarantula technique is to look at a combination of passing and failing test cases. Here I'm showing the coverage of one passing and one failing. The lines that are colored green here are executed only by the passing test case. The lines that are colored red are executed only by the failing test case. And those that are executed by both are colored here in red. But this gets more interesting as we add more test cases <coughs> to this visualization. As we add more and more passing and failing test cases, the coloring of the lines of code becomes more interesting and more revealing of which parts of the code contribute most to, those, to the failing outcome of your test suite. Now this tool um, is called Tarantula. It, you know, the idea here is that we can then go and look at this, these, these automatic recommendations for where you should start your debugging process. Um, but this early research motivated the two projects that I'm going to talk about today. Um, the, the first question, one of the questions that I had was, 
this, you know, you see there's red code here, there's bright red code here, and there's bright red code here. And one of the questions I had was, well, are those three separate bugs, or is that, is that code that interacts and cooperates to maybe all contribute to the same type of failure? Um, and so I created a um, visualization with my graduate students to represent these lines of code <coughs> now in a graph. So these dots represent the same lines of code that you just saw on the previous visualization, but they are freed from their source code files where they actually lie. So they're allowed to move towards the other lines that they interact with dynamically. So when they execute, when they're working together or they're calling each other or they're sharing variables, um, then they create more edges and they pull together more closely. And in fact, we do in fact see that even though those red lines of code were in disparate parts of the source code, they do indeed all work tightly together. Um, and this led into our project uh, that we call Cerebro. Um, this is the same type of visualization where I'm showing source code and the individual dots represent lines of code. The color of the dots represents the file from which they come, or the class, because this is a Java program. And the edges uh, represent execution flow. So anytime one statement is followed by another statement, in execution, from a number of executions, we add an edge. And when one statement follows another frequently, we make those edges thicker and bind them more closely. Um, and so what we end up seeing here is kind of a clustering of code that performs different internal behaviors. And here we see there's one <coughs> cluster here that looks like it's cohesive in terms of the file in the, the the classes from which they come. All these are all these purple nodes. But we also see a big cluster here that is highly interrelated between a lot of different files to perform some functionality, and so on. So in this way, we kind of can do a little bit of like architectural recovery. We then can go and look and see what are these, um, these kind of clusters of code and what do they relate to, uh, what kind of behaviors do they relate to. But the cool part is, is that we can actually replay execution. So here's a sample execution that went into uh, informing this graph. Notice that, so this is actually <coughs> executing the code, and it's highlighting the lines that are executed at that point in time. And you can notice that there's certain kind of shapes that reoccur. You see this thing that comes down here, that's one kind of behavior. This swoop up here is a certain kind of behavior. This cluster seems to keep reoccurring and reoccurring, um, and so on. So we see lots of reoccurring behaviors internally in the system. Um, and so this observation of these reoccurring patterns uh, informed the next phase of our research where we're actually looking now for these phases and trying to help people understand an execution over the whole uh, length of executions. Uh, this particular tool, Cerebro, uh, was worked on by uh, uh, a few grad students who will be around during the, um, the poster session. So if you want to see a demo of this um, or talk more about this, you know, feel free to come and talk to Vijay Palapu or Jay Waku. Um, so the next uh, part of my talk, I want to talk about the identification of those patterns that we saw in the Cerebro visualization when we watched an execution. The main goal here is that what we want to be able to do is for a given execution, we want to be able to automatically abstract up to something that's actually comprehensible to developers so that you can understand like, oh, this execution is spending a lot of time doing this kind of behavior or, or you know, have a high level view of what's going on internally in your system. Um, so the kind of the vision was that we'd have some kind of a timeline where we could get to see phases of execution automatically identified and automatically abstracted up from the low level information. The challenge is, is that these execution traces are enormous. So even just for a single execution, we're having millions of uh, instructions or um, execution events. In this particular um, technique, we're using method invocations. Um, so we have millions of events that are happening internally. Um, 
And so the, the first challenge, if we're going to abstract up to execution phases, is that we need to some way to kind of draw some boundaries in there. So these are all kind of undifferentiated instructions, and we need some way <coughs> to kind of to abstract that up. The first part of this technique <coughs> is, to, is to find some way to partition up this space. Um, so one of the things we observed is that given that these are method invocations, there's a call depth that, you know, it goes deeper and it pops out and it goes deeper and it pops out. And the insight here was that anytime there's a valley, is, is the time that there's a, there's, there's a peak followed by a valley, that peak is representing some kind of low level behavior, right? And when it goes down and it pops back up, that means something has completed at that point and then we can continue. And so our preliminary um, partitioning of this execution trace identifies those little valleys in the, call, the dynamic call graph, or um, call depth. And there's a lot more details here, but I'm kind of summarizing high level um, of how this works. But we do a preliminary partitioning of the input space. <coughs> Um, okay, so then now using this preliminary, these preliminary phases, we now perform a number of other steps. So um, we perform a duplicate detection because it turns out we see a lot of um, exact duplicates of the sequences of method calls that <coughs> we can identify as, okay, we've seen that before exactly. But we also then see almost duplicates. So the first phase is just a, a really cheap duplicate detection. It brings down the, the cost of processing this enormous input space. Um, and then we perform a clustering. And this, the idea of the clustering is that a lot of these <coughs> behaviors only differ a little bit. So we think that probably the same high level behavior is being described by these preliminary phases, but there's just small you know, differences, it went down a true branch instead of a false branch or something like that during execution. But we want to still kind of consider those things as probably about the same kind of behavior. <coughs> and then the real kind of computational force here happens during the sequential pattern mining. And the sequential pattern mining can identify frequent patterns in these executions. And so this is actually trained and informed by a number of executions. So we're looking at, oh, I see that every single execution starts with <coughs> this sequence of behaviors, and then it's followed by this sequence of behaviors, and so on. The problem with sequential pattern mining is that it's really expensive, and uh, it would not be scalable if we were to per perform this on the just low-level execution events. But because we perform these, these first two phases, it actually brings, uh, sequential pattern mining into being something that we can actually do. Um, and so, and then, once we have done those stages, we get some high level um, phases, execution phases, and what we want to then do is apply some textual labels um, informed by the source code. So we look into the source code and we see lots of method names and identifiers in there. And there, you know, you can use the camel casing to identify what are the frequent terms that are in there to help describe what those phases actually mean. So these are actual results <coughs> from our tool called Sage. Um, this is uh, uh, applied to the Java compiler, uh, Java C. Um, and so and this is actually, the result is a hierarchical representation of execution. So you can look at the most abstract version, which is like just some initialization, and then compile. So that's not very useful, and you probably want to dig into the compile phase, and you can look deeper, and you can see that we see certain um, phases within there with the automatically applied uh, labels that we extracted from the source code. You can zoom in. This is an interactive visualization where you can zoom and pan and, and then you know, pop the bubble and look more deeply into individual phases. But here I'm just zooming in on this, um, this part of the visualization. And you can see, you know, we have attribute handling, we have um, information flow analysis, then we have desugaring and code <coughs> generation that are happening in here. So this actually kind of meets with expectations for how a compiler uh, works. Um, 
for that particular sample execution, which is representative of the executions we looked at for Java C, we had about one mi over one million execution events, these are method calls, um, in the original trace, but we were able to abstract this up to 57 phases at the, at, the, at the kind of the deepest level. So, you know, at the high level, you saw there was just two, and then as you look deeper and deeper and deeper, you start to see, you know, the behaviors that are within <coughs> there. But now we're actually getting to, into the realm of comprehensible by people, so people can actually understand executions. And we think that this could be, and this is early, this is early on right now, we still have more empirical uh, evaluation to do, and we still have improvements that we need to do on the, the tool and on the analysis, but we think that this is promising and could help developers understand things about you know, anomalous um, executions or where lots of time is being spent within your, within your code. Um, and it's kind of an automatic logging. So, you know, right now you can do a manual process of putting log messages in there. But this way, we can just monitor an execution as it's going and actually abstract up to automatic logs of those executions. Um, and this work, uh, again, is being supported by uh, graduate students. Uh, Yang Fang is going to be presenting this work in the, in the poster session. <coughs> and also, Kai Dreef um, also worked on this project. So today, I talked about two new projects, uh, Cerebro, which can allow you to kind of get a, a, a reverse engineering of what different code is responsible for different features. And I presented Sage that uh, abstracts execution traces up to comprehensible execution phases so you can understand what individual executions are doing um, while it's running. Um, Thank you, and I'll take any questions that you might have. All right. Thank you. All right, we have time for a few questions while the next speaker sets up. Have you looked at um, analyzing the use of data and transformations <coughs> on the data over time? Those two um, we are looking at, we have looked so far at data flow. Um, how data flows through a system, but that is, what you're talking about is looking at transformations of data over time. That's something that <coughs> I'm, it's something I talk about with the grad students constantly. I think that that would be an interesting thing to look at. You know, of course the problem, when you're just looking at execution events, it's, it's still expensive, but if you're looking at data and how data transforms and is read and write, read and written to, and the, how the data structures evolve, boy, that's a really expensive instrumentation. I still think it would be really interesting to look at, but we haven't really gone, gone that far yet. Yes, uh, is there a relation between what you call behaviors and what developers call design pattern? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Because in the case of design patterns, one tries to uh, ask, you know, why do you have this pattern? Why do you have that pattern? Yeah. When you think of it, the design patterns behave like an alphabet, and yet you cannot find a reason. In the case of an alphabet, the, the origin of <coughs> alphabet is phonetic. Every uh, a word is a phonetic rendition using letters, symbols. It's a symbolic sure. rendition of phonetics, but that's all you can say. So what in here, what do you think, what, what do you think, where would you get to? if you continue like this? Well, I mean, I think that, um, I, I think that a lot of times you can use, you can design using different patterns um, and still result in the same result. So you could use a visitor pattern or you can use, you, you, you could <coughs> distribute your code in different ways. But I th it, think it would be interesting to look at during execution for a, for a system that was written both ways. Do they abstract up to the same behaviors regardless of how you factored your code, how you decomposed your code. I kind of think that we're going to see similar behaviors despite how, what design pattern you used. But I can't be 100% sure about that, and I think that would be really interesting to, to look at. And I agree with your, your analogy of the, the alphabet. I think that's, that's interesting. All right, last question real quick. Have you looked at combining some of this research with Dr. Lopes's work to identify common modules that 
are either <coughs> triggered as likely of either being having problems or or being misused to introduce some of these defects that, that you're interested in finding? Uh, I think that would be very interesting to look at. Of course, the, my analysis often requires some instrumentation that slows down an execution quite a lot. Hers is at a huge, vast scale. So the, we're talking at kind of extremes, but I, I just nevertheless think that there is promise. from hers in terms of you know, identifying, if, if I have problems here, oh, that bit of code is, is a common module that's used all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm, having pro if, if I'm identifying defects relative to that, there might be something inside, or it might just be that the interface is such that people get confused and use it wrong. Yeah, I agree. That would be that would be that would be fun. All right, All right. we can have more questions around the posters for sure. Let's thank Jim again.